Welcome to the University of Melbourne and to the Centre for Advanced Journalism. My name is Margaret Simons. I'm the director of the centre, and this is our first major public event for the year. Our speaker tonight is Professor Julian Disney. I'll give him a fuller introduction in a moment. But perhaps, first of all, I can just set some context for this address. I'd like to take you back to October 2009, when Professor Disney's predecessor, Ken McKinnon, used his last annual report as chair of the Australian Press Council to call for a review of the accountability of newspaper editors. And he fired a parting shot at the industry, accusing it of undermining the Press Council's role and independence. He flayed the industry for what he said was a failure to live up to its own rhetoric on ethics, privacy and independence. And he gave as examples the famous Utegate scandal involving Godwin Gretsch and the publication of photos supposedly of Pauline Hanson as examples of the media failing to observe its own standards. He sledged so-called reform proposals urged by newspaper publishers that resulted in a reduction in the Press Council's membership and activities. And the result, he said, had been a downgrading and perhaps even an elimination of the Council's role in defending press freedom. Now, our speaker tonight is a brave man, and the reason I say that is probably fairly apparent when I say that just a few weeks after that sledging from the former chair of the Press Council, it was announced that Julian Disney would be the next chair. This was the environment he came into. Since then, he's led a reform movement in consultation with the nation's largest publishers, which over that time has seen funding restored, standards reviewed and renewed, better procedures, and a raise in the Council's profile, which has led to a doubling in the number of complaints it's receiving from the public. But of course, nothing stands still in the world of media. At the same time, we've had the News of the World scandal in the United Kingdom, which has meant that media standards and journalism ethics have been a front of mind issue around the world and particularly perhaps in Australia. And for this and other political reasons, we've had our own Finkelstein inquiry, which has recommended that the Australian Press Council be abolished to be replaced with a government funded statutory body, the News Media Council, with power to force the publication of corrections, apologies and rights of reply. These recommendations have been vehemently opposed by all the mainstream media organisations. <laughs> Meanwhile, Julian Disney has urged the publishers to improve the funding and powers of the Australian Press Council if they want to avoid the Finkelstein regime. Julian Disney is a part-time professor and director of the Social Justice Project at the University of New South Wales. He has been previously been professor of public law at the Australian National University and director of its Centre for International and Public Law. He is also a visiting professor at the University of Technology, Sydney. Indeed, his list of roles in public advocacy, policy development, law reform, and as an advisor to governments is far too long to be encapsulated here. He's a man with a lot of experience in public life, and given this history and his present position, you can see why I call him courageous. His work was clearly influential on Ray Finkelstein, and he is now at the centre of the debate about journalism standards in the wake of the Finkelstein report. This is his first major address since the Finkelstein report was released. I'll ask you to join me in welcoming Professor Julian Disney. Thanks very much, uh, Margaret, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm sometimes melancholic when I come past this building because, um, uh, as you may be aware, this is where the stonemasons, uh, or just out that way, stonemasons downed their tools in uh, the 1850s and uh, marched into Melbourne uh, in search of an eight-hour day. And it's a long time since I had an eight-hour day. Um, I was thinking that perhaps we might all um, disband this evening and uh, march on Melbourne, but then I thought our credibility would be limited in that um, I've volunteered to speak. I've already done eight hours today, and you've volunteered to listen, and I'll bet you've done eight hours. So um, we probably haven't got much credibility in complaining. Um, I, Margaret asked me to, uh, to um, speak, or we sort of agreed on uh, the topic of... Um, uh, why good journalism will always matter. 
Uh, I've dealt with journalists a lot over the last uh, 30 odd years uh, and I know enough about them to know that the best thing to do is touch briefly on the topic that they've raised and uh, then move on to what you wanted to say anyway. Uh, and I'll, I'll comply with that um, tonight. But I think probably what I'm going to say is what Margaret had in mind in any event. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit about um, good journalism and journalism, uh, but then I'll um, focus on media standards, particularly in the context of uh, the debate that's occurring here in uh, Australia and in the UK, and I might add also in New Zealand. I think there's some very important work being done on uh, options for media regulation in uh, New Zealand. Um, I'm not, an, and this isn't attempting to, um, attempting to abandon um, the category of media academics, who of course are a little bit beleaguered at the moment, but I do need to emphasise I'm not a media academic and therefore I'm not speaking uh, from a theoretical point of view at all. More really from a practical point of view in two senses. One is I have been for, for some decades particularly active in uh, public advocacy in various areas and, and often also in leading coalitions of business and community groups, which is a little similar to what the Press Council is. Uh, and so I'm drawing really on that practical experience of engaging uh, with the media from that point of view. And I think that that, that side of uh, the media experience does need to be heard more um, by the media practitioners themselves. Um, but I'm also dra drawing uh, now on two years, not, not huge time, but two years of experience as uh, chairing the council. Um, I agreed to chair the council um, because uh, it was weak. Um, I find it a bit odd when people say, and they've said it to me on a couple of times in my life, why are, you, why are you working so hard on that body? It's so weak, it's a waste of time. Well, I don't think that's the first question you should ask. The first question you should ask is, does this body have an important role to play? Is there a better body around that can play that role or is playing that role? Or is this the best hope? Uh, and if that's the case, then the fact that it's uh, weak at the time is in fact an argument for engaging with it, not an argument for regarding it as uh, beyond redemption. So I took some time when I was approached um, about chairing the council before I decided to do it. Um, but it was to a considerable extent because I thought uh, it was the best hope of the site um, and uh, it, um, for a variety of reasons, hadn't been able to be effective and uh, that we needed to try and help it um, be effective. Uh, the, um, so I'll turn first then to very briefly what is good journalism, but I'm not going to really um, attempt to be particularly profound or original. There are others who are much better uh, able to say that uh, or, or to uh, meet those requirements than I am. But I, I'll just say a few things about, firstly, what I would see as the, the basic requirements of uh, good journalism. And to some extent, these are based on uh, the council standards. But there's quite a striking similarity, in fact, between our standards and the standards as espoused in newspaper codes. And I've just been looking uh, this morning uh, when I met with 9MSN, who have indicated a desire to join the council. I've been looking at their code. And they have um, the same three words at the core of their code as we have at the core of ours. And those words are accuracy, fairness, and balance. Uh, accuracy, um, we actually focus particularly on reasonable attempts to be accurate. Um, that's really the, uh, the top priority. And if those attempts fail and one is inaccurate, then one must very promptly uh, correct the inaccuracy. Uh, fairness is um, a somewhat more amorphous uh, concept, but it includes, for example, not distorting uh, what one's reporting about or one, what one's expressing opinions about. Uh, not causing offence, but I do think this is an example of where our principles and the principles of many of the newspapers themselves need further thought. I'm, I'm not keen on principles which are too strict or too utopian and therefore are not applied. And I think that applies to some of our principles and I think it uh, quite often applies actually to, to um, statements within newspaper codes. We don't require, and we shouldn't require, I think, that every article is balanced in itself. And yet, reading our principles, you might think we do, and reading newspapers' codes, you might think they do. So I think we need to tease out that a little bit more uh, in some of our work. We also don't um, require, and I don't think we should require, that a newspaper be immaculately balanced in its coverage over time. It's a question of degree. Uh, and I think we don't indicate that clearly enough in our principles. Uh, 
So balance, for those reasons amongst others, is a complex concept, and it's certainly not, and I know this is a, a controversial area to which there's no easy answer, but balance doesn't mean having to represent all views, and it doesn't mean giving equal weight to all views. I do have some concern, not so much in the newspapers actually, but I'd have to say my concern probably relates more to the ABC, and I can speak with Gay Abandon about them since uh, we don't have any uh, responsibility for them at all. But I do think it's a great mistake and that it's damaging actually to public policy and to public life and public discussion to think that the best way um, to provide balance is to put two extreme views up against each other. This is what I call the crossfire approach. If any of you have seen crossfire in the United States, which um, thrives on extremist uh, adversarial debate, um, I think is, is damaging. It's driving moderates to some extent out of public debate. Uh, and I think that's very unfortunate. So balance isn't met just by putting two extremes up against each other, nor is it met just by providing equal time for all views. I don't pretend there's an easy answer to what it is, but I'm just trying to say some things about what I don't think it is. Um, there's also uh, uh, an area of our standards which probably, generically speaking, one could talk about as a, a sense of respect or civility. So this includes, for example, protecting privacy, though perhaps we need to be a bit more specific about what we mean by that. And we also have a word that does worry me to some extent, which is not um, upsetting people's sensibilities. I think that's too strict a standard, not too sure uh, what it means, but if newspapers really weren't able to upset people's sensibilities, um, we'd lose a hell of a lot. So, and yet again, you'll see those terms in newspapers' codes themselves. Um, so I think we need to try and get the wording more accurate, get the standards more accurate, and then apply them. Not have them as utopian and extreme and then say, well, of course, we can't possibly apply that. But obviously, those are the things that I feel anyway are the sort of basic requirements of good journalism. That's focusing more on content, but there are also questions, of course, about how you've gathered the information. Um, and uh, that touches on things like uh, the use of dishonest or unfair means. Now, we don't, and I don't think we should, um, uh, totally preclude the use of dishonest or unfair means. Um, we do say that it can be legitimate if it's in the public interest. Now, I think we need to say a little bit more about the strength of public interest that's required, that it needs to be very clear and it needs to be major in order to justify the use of dishonest or unfair means. But we don't preclude them and I don't think we should. Um, though there may be scope for us to do more work in the area um, of harassment. Uh, our counterpart in the United Kingdom is very active uh, in um, relation to, and probably more successful and quite well regarded by the media, in relation to things like trying to stop harassment of um, uh, people by print journalists and also, of course, it flows over into the broadcast media. And that's something I hope that uh, we'll be able to combine with uh, ACMA, which regulates broadcast um, uh, journalism, um, to try to uh, um, move fairly quickly in some of the areas. We had it in Sydney recently with the so-called collar bomb um, incident where uh, there was harassment for much too long uh, of the uh, schoolgirl involved, quite unjustifiable, um, and we're going to need to get our act together in the future to deal with that more. Now, I think probably much of that was to do more with the electronic media than the print media, but certainly some print media was involved. And when I spoke to one of them as to why his reporters were out here, he said, because the opposition's reporters were out there. If I'd asked the opposition, they would probably have said the same thing. Uh, and so we need to try and do something in that area. But of course, in addition to those basic requirements, there are things that are more positive, like knowledge and, put and um, uh, perception, uh, originality, persistence, courage. Uh, I, I'm quite frequently um, struck by and grateful for the courage. I don't just mean physical courage. Um, I mean at least as much courage in facing entrenched interests that journalists provide. Um, very often one does say thank God for the contribution that they've made in exposing things. Now sometimes the downside for that, often to stand up against vested interests, to be confident enough of one's own opinion to challenge those vested interests, can come from a personality which is pretty self-confident and pretty aggressive. Um, we get some value from that because it does mean that we get strong vested interests exposed that we otherwise wouldn't get. It can sometimes flow over, I think, into less desirable uh, elements and, and perspectives in the media of excessive aggression uh, and um, excessive self-confidence. Um, and also, of course, sometimes um, they need just some, uh, some basic cunning to, uh, to um, thwart those who don't uh, want to tell them the truth. <coughs> 
Uh, I think it's important to emphasise, though, that good journalism, I think, matters more than ever. Uh, and uh, that's partly because, from a positive point of view, there are now so many benefits that can be obtained from new technologies and brought to us through good journalism. In other words, the sort of palette that's available to journalists now is so much richer because of the internet. That means those who can master these new skills and opportunities um, can really make a very great contribution to us. And you see this in, in some uh, newspapers and others abroad, um, uh, and uh, it's, it's starting to develop here. So that's one reason that why it matters more than ever, that I think the opportunities and the potential benefits of, of, of damn good journalism are, uh, are, are greater. Um, it's also that related to that is that the bar is being raised in various ways. Um, the extent to which now journalists, I hope not all, and I'll come back to wh why, but journalists need to have a wider range of skills, need to be able to think more about putting links into their articles, about bringing in more graphics than they were able to before because of the, the uh, opportunities that online provides. Um, so even just for competitive reasons, uh, good journalism is going to matter um, more than ever. Just to digress as to why I hope not everyone will be required to do that, one thing that has struck me from when I first started engaging with journalists a long time ago was how people who from uh, the way in which they wrote, you would imagine to be extremely articulate and fluent and confident orally, when I met them were often not at all. And you could realise why, for some of them, why they'd become journalists. They weren't comfortable orally, they often weren't com comfortable in, in, uh, in society. Um, but they had a lot to offer and they f found it uh, easiest to do that in writing. And I hope we won't lose them. I hope we won't lose them because they can't front up to, to do the quick video link. They don't, they don't feel they've got the, uh, uh, the personality, the way of thinking, or perhaps their bosses don't think they have the personality or way of thinking that will handle that element of journalism. It's important that we still keep a place for those people who don't have those characteristics but have a huge amount to offer through their, their um, uh, capacities for thought and their capacities for written expression. I think it also matters more than ever because the sifting, which is really one of the key roles of journalism in my view, not all journalism of course, but a very important part of it, the sifting of material um, is now likely to be very much harder in many areas, partly just because of the enormous increase in the volume of material to sift, uh, again partly because of inter the internet, partly because of globalisation in any event, even if, even if there wasn't the internet. And related to that, um, not only a greater volume, but a greater diversity of sources and a greater likelihood that some of the sources are not well known to the reporter, which makes it harder to sift them for, for uh, reliability. So that's an increased challenge. And another challenge which is of huge importance, and is probably my main reason for why I think uh, journal good journalism is more important than ever, is that uh, errors now, if made, are more widespread, by and large, because of the internet. So uh, they go out to a wider range of people. Um, they can be uh, and, uh, and they can be passed on before there's much opportunity to correct them at all, whether by the reporter doing it or by other people expressing opinions. It's a huge mistake to say, as I heard one very senior executive say to me very early in my time as chair of the council, we can put it up and we can change it later. That's a huge mistake um, to just rely on that view. Um, with a lot of this stuff, you can't change it later. Well, you can change it later, but the old stuff will still be there and going around and around like space junk um, in perpetuity. We really can't accept uh, the view that you can uh, rush something out to, uh, to beat the opposition and tidy it up later. And that's, that's a great challenge and another reason why I think good journalism is more important than ever. And, of course, speed, the rush to judgment, does um, create greater risks. We need to be careful, I think, of complacency, of saying, for example, that the problems in the United Kingdom were heavily driven by the competition between the red tops, between the tabloids. Um, that is certainly true, and we don't have that here. But here and in other parts of the world, some of, some of the elements, um, the detrimental impacts of competition, are emerging from the internet, um, the pressure to, to rush to judgment, um, to beat the others by a nanosecond. Um, the pressure also to be more flamboyant and simplistic. Those are some of the negative sides um, that we need to be careful of and could induce um, uh, elements of the, um, of, of the undesirable as aspects of competition that we saw leading to problems in the United Kingdom. So complacency, I think, is, is we should be very wary of and I think uh, some say that uh, we shouldn't be paying attention to the debate in the United Kingdom about media regulation. I totally disagree with that. 
Uh, I think it's actually uh, much more uh, sophisticated and thoughtful and that the media is engaging it in a much more open way than most, not all, most of their counterparts here in Australia. Now, it may be that they're doing that because they've been blasted out of complacency uh, and it may be that that blast won't happen here. Um, but the degree of, uh, I think, recognition that uh, a simplistic uh, rebuttal of views um, from an extreme perspective um, is not sufficient. Um, I think that's been realised more in the United Kingdom and there are a lot of positive proposals, detailed proposals being put by leading editors um, in the United Kingdom that we're tending not to get as much of in Australia but with some striking exceptions uh, here. There are two or three, I think, who are doing a great job um, and I hope there'll be more. Um, well, can I move on then to um, some comments about uh, media standards in Australia uh, and then I... Um, uh, um, well, sorry, before that, I'll, I'll just, um, having said something about um, what is good journalism, I just wanted, um, without attempting to answer the question, hugely say, well, that raises the question, what's a journalist? Oh, sorry, who's a journalist? Um, now, it's probably agreed, I won't go into the sort of detail that uh, the media academics will on this, but I think, broadly speaking, um, the, base, the base role is, is gathering or analysing or presenting information or opinion. But, of course, the advent of the internet has really... Um, uh, destroyed to some extent the neat clarity of um, the definition or at least of its practical clarity. Uh, it was fairly easy until perhaps 10 years ago to say that person's a journalist and that one isn't. It was mainly based, I think, whether rationally or not on whether it was their main occupation or not. But now, of course, we have so many people for whom um, that role that I've spoken about is not their main occupation um, but who do have, um, uh, amongst other things, widespread exposure for what they're saying. Some people call the distinction, um, they say all these folk are, are journalists, so they'd include uh, bloggers. Um, they say all these folk are journalists and the distinction is between perhaps professional journalists and something like citizen journalists or public journalists. So that says everyone's a journalist, but it still has, there tends to be an acceptance, uh, an acceptance that there's some degree of distinction within that broad category. Others... Um, uh, don't regard it as a distinction within a category but as two different categories. So there's a journalist and then there's the great unwashed, the, uh, the news gatherers, some call them, or sources or whatever. Um, but uh, um, we are going to have to face this question, at least for some purposes, not necessarily in terms of what the definition of journalism is, but in terms of who is going to get uh, the array of privileges that have been provided over time to journalists and were provided to them at a time when there was not much doubt in people's minds, um, both the recipients' minds and the people who were granting the privileges, there was not much doubt as to who qualified as journalist. But there's much more doubt now and that will grow. And if we don't um, clarify this to some extent, one of the problems uh, will be that I think there'll be a reluctance to provide or to maintain those privileges um, if there's um, great uncertainty as to who it is that one's giving the privileges to. Now, these privileges may relate to content, for example. There are privileges uh, that relate to people who are called journalists or media organisations or whatever to do with privacy, uh, to do with um, defamation, to do with the provision of financial advice and in various other areas. The Finkelstein Report has a very good summary of these, as does the New Zealand Law Commission Report uh, that I've referred to indirectly before. Those are privileges in relation to content. There are privileges in relation to access, access to courts, access to governments such as, uh, and access to parliament. Um, there's also, and I think uh, Margaret Simons has referred to this and others have, there's actually just the sort of um, inestimable privilege of being able to call someone up on the phone and say you're a journalist and they'll answer questions they'd never dream of answering um, to other people who, who they would dismiss rapidly as uh, nosy and impertinent. Um, so we are going to have to think through this uh, some more and particularly as convergence further progresses as to who is going to have these privileges. Um, that may be partly for the reason that the New Zealand Law Commission has, has put, which is usually in life we regard um, privileges as carrying corresponding obligations. Uh, so that's one reason that we may need to, uh, to think it through. But the other is, as I say, that these privileges may not be maintained or may not be granted um, if uh, governments or others who are giving them don't feel they know who they're being given to. That's a reason, for example, why the shield laws that... Uh, um, enable journalists not to disclose the identity of, of whistleblowers. Um, the state governments so far have refused to extend them beyond a narrow definition of journalists, 
because they don't have an alternative definition of journalists that they're confident and, uh, excludes uh, people who they would regard as, as likely to be irresponsible. So there needs to be some thinking about that. Uh, now what we tend to do in other professions and occupations is we often, if we're defining a category that we're going to give special privileges, whether it's doctors or lawyers or whatever, we look at their role, um, but we don't just look at their role. We look at their training, uh, and we may have requirements in relation to training and accreditation. Uh, and we look at the extent to which they're subject to a centralised and respected system of standards and complaints handling. So if, if you look at how we do it in other walks of life, that's how we do it. Now that doesn't mean we need to do it exactly the same way here. There are different considerations in relation to the media, not always as different, I think, as some in the media believe, but I accept that there are some differences. For example, I'm certainly not at all keen on a sort of credentialised approach to, um, to coming into journalism with people having to have done a doctorate or something before they can uh, write 100 words. Um, so I'm not arguing for that particularly, but the question of a complaints and standards system, um, uh, I just point out, has been regarded as a pretty crucial part of uh, identification of other people to whom privileges are given. Okay, um, the, uh, let me move on then to media standards and just um, some <coughs> comments about them, inevitably um, pretty uh, much of a broad overview, and then I want to get to the question of regulation and the issues of, uh, that are right in front of us uh, at the moment. Um, in, in talking about media standards, I'm going to focus mainly on uh, print and online, uh, and really much of the um, material that I think one needs to look at and think about um, in this is in the Finkelstein report. I think there's a very good coverage of the surveys that have been done in relation to levels of public trust and public confidence, etc. I think it's not true, incidentally, to, to assert, as, as um, some have, that those Surveys are a test of popularity. They're not a test of popularity. They were, they were carefully designed, and, uh, or the particular one that's often quoted, the Australian Election Survey study. Um, it was to do with trust and public confidence, and it came up with a very low figure for print media. Uh, and one can't just say, well, that's um, the name of the game in media, because some media, and the ABC stood out, some media did a hell of a lot better. So we do need to think about that. That's a warning sign. Um, and even if one's just concerned about market forces and declining circulation, that's a worry. And I think one of the roles the council has in, is in its modest way to try and help lift these figures up to more respectable figures of trust and public confidence. <coughs> but we also have the concerns that have been expressed over the years by many widely respected citizens and journalists, sometimes publicly, sometimes not. I've just spoken in the last month or so to probably six or seven of the, of the, of the most widely respected ten most widely respected journalists in Australia, spoken to them individually. All of them um, very worried about some aspects of media standards. Now that's not surprising. This is not that the media is worse than anyone else, it's just that it's not better either. Uh, any walk of life, there, there will be scope for substantial improvement. Each of us probably could substantially improve whatever we're doing uh, and would probably benefit from hearing the views of people who are, who are not too close to us and not too... Um, not too much with the same vested interests as we have. Um, so this isn't um, uh, particularly uh, wanting to single out um, the media area, but just to say there's not the slightest justification for complacency. Um, too many sensible and widely respected people have pointed out problems. And as I say, many of them have been journalists themselves, just in terms of people who've been on the public record recently. You'll see Laurie Oakes and Barry Cassidy um, are just two. Um, we've also conducted um, what I hope we'll be able to do much more of, which is uh, community round tables. Um, uh, we've, uh, in four states, uh, in the morning we met with about 20 journalists uh, and in the afternoon we met with uh, about 20 community leaders from a very wide range, business, environment, welfare, local council, um, union, etc. Um, and uh, a striking feature of that, incidentally, was how many of the community leaders said, and I'm afraid it came as no surprise to me because I've been in that role myself, um, that they would not speak out publicly about problems with the media because they feared that it would adversely affect the coverage they get in future. And that is a problem if that's the situation. Uh, it means we're not hearing uh, enough of their concerns from serious, serious citizens. They also don't have much contact with editors. I've spoken to editors about this and I've been very pleased that they've re responded favourably to the idea that I might try to bring together uh, an editor with a few community leaders, just three or four people uh, meeting informally to discuss issues. 
Um, the community leaders, by and large, except perhaps in the business community, tend to have very little contact with the editors themselves. Um, I, when I was leading community groups, met frequently with prime ministers and treasurers and senior ministers. I never met with an editor in that whole time. I spoke recently to the head of, probably the longest serving head of a national NGO in Australia. He said he had never in his 12 or 13 years at the helm met an editor. Uh, and yet editors are and should be um, very influential on what is in their newspapers. We need to try to break down that, uh, that divide. And the divide is getting worse in a way because editors now, under the new 24-hour news cycle, have to spend so much time uh, minding the shop. Um, there's not just one deadline a day. So I think that, uh, and it would also bring home to the community leaders who, who you know, are no more um, uh, necessarily um, inherently fair and rational than uh, the media people I'm speaking about, um, to bring across to them more of uh, the other side of the picture um, and the other perspectives. Uh, the, um, it's not sufficient, I think, as, as I've seen too many journalists do, um, to say, uh, well, when there's criticism, to say, well, we're not perfect, and then move on without indicating anything about what they think are the imperfections, or to say, well, there are some problems, but then never indicate what they are um, or what might be done about them. Or, and this is a, a strategy I saw just a couple of days ago, to hugely exaggerate the criticism that's being made, to say, well, you know, not all journalists are waiting to hack phones. Well, of course they're not. No one's suggesting that. Um, but that sort of uh, exaggeration of the argument, the straw man approach, um, has been resorted to too often in public, in private. Uh, I know because I've, I've, as I say, known a lot of journalists well, personal friends for a long time. It's a much more constructive and realistic approach and we need to somehow try and uh, uh, build on that. Um, and uh, I think that's a role that we can uh, play at the council, not necessarily leading to any standards that we develop, certainly not leading to complaints, but just leading to try and get uh, key players together to try to think about uh, um, uh, how they and their organisations can improve their performance. Um, well, I want to move on then to the last um, part of what I was going to say, which is to do with uh, what people often call regulation, so I'll use that term although I don't really see the Press Council as a regulator. Um, I haven't been able to come up with a better term. We're not just an ombudsman either, um, but I don't really see us as a full-blown regulator, nor that we uh, should be. Um, but we do um, have an influence on standards and should have a greater influence than we've had to date. Uh, the background to, to what I'm going to say is that really um, convergence um, uh, between uh, broadcast media, other new technologies, and uh, print, is really going to be, I think, the driving force in terms of changing regulatory systems. There's been too much focus, I think, by opponents of some of the changes that are being proposed on what uh, Mr Finkelstein may have said or on the um, iniquities of the Gillard government or the um, undesirability of, the Brown, uh, of uh, Senator Brown having uh, persuaded that government to set up the inquiry. That's a very short-term, limited focus. These issues... Um, we're going to come up anyway as to what regulatory system we're going to need in the future. And the Council developed our views, which we've stayed with ever since, before Finkelstein had even been set up. Because we're going to get eventually the need to come together um, in one regulatory system. I'll say a little bit more about some refinements of that in a minute. But we are going to have to come together in one regulatory system. And we're going to, in a sense, have a choice. We're going to have a choice between what currently happens in the broadcast area, which is a, a statutory authority with substantial statutory powers, uh, the members of the authority appointed by government, uh, fully funded by government, uh, etc. That model. Uh, and at the other end, some, or not the other end, but uh, towards the other end of the spectrum, some form of council which doesn't have those key characteristics that I mentioned. Now, the press council in the past, in my view, has been down an unacceptable, unacceptably far down the other end of the spectrum, uh, too weak and ineffective. But we need to develop an independent council as a model, uh, as an alternative to the statutory model, so that when the time comes and a choice will have to be made, which it will, whatever one may think about Finkelstein or about Bob Brown or anything, this choice is going to have to be made. I don't know exactly when, but in five, five or ten years, we will have to um, converge more in these regulatory systems. And our goal at the Press Council is to develop a strong model of an independent council which is available to be chosen, hopefully, at the time when that choice has to be made, because we don't like the statutory authority model of the ACMA. Now that's for different reasons for different members of the council. Some don't like um, bodies that are um, fully or substantially government funded, 
Others don't like them if they are that and government appointed. Uh, others believe that statutory authorities, especially if they're subject to the very detailed rules of statutory decision making, are inevitably too legalistic, uh, slow, um, possibly adversarial, and that that means that uh, um, a large number of um, uh, the mainstream of the community won't really be able to take advantage of them. And that's certainly central to my own concerns about a large bureaucracy playing this role. I just don't think it will be effectively available to, um, frankly, the people in the community who most need it because they don't have much influence to get their own way anyway. I was involved with a complaint recently where, without being very specific, the complainant um, had the assistance um, because of a close relationship of one of our four or five wealthiest people um, in Australia. Uh, now, that complainant came to us and we rang the newspaper in question, but we weren't needed. Um, the wealthy person had already run, run the newspaper and the matter had been sold very quickly. Uh, we weren't needed. Um, but uh, we are needed in other cases where you haven't got those sorts of uh, friends to um, exert some pressure. Uh, so we believe that there should be a two-phase approach to this. Firstly, to strengthen the press council in the way that I've um, uh, foreshadowed, but I'll mention some key elements, so that we do have a strong independent council uh, as, as a choice when the time comes. Some elements of, of that then. Firstly, the ambit of it, we do think it should be print and online. That's a huge challenge just to work with print and online and perhaps in question some more um, uh, issues about uh, online can be dealt with. But I'm very pleased that Crikey has uh, indicated that they will join us uh, and 9MSN has also indicated that they would like to join us and we have several other online only publishers, um, <coughs> smallish ones, but they're the ones who've approached us. We actually haven't um, approached anyone ex except uh, Crikey so far. The others have come to us. But it is very important that print and online go forward together. Um, it's quite irrational to have them uh, separate, uh, confusing and inefficient when there's so much overlap with so many things appearing on both uh, media um, or very similar things appearing on both media. Um, so print and online first. To bring broadcasting in is a massive task, extremely hard to work through and uh, I think for that, amongst other reasons, need to be left until later. We do need, though, the... Uh, the um, Press Council to have uh, legally binding obligations now from the publishers. These must be firmly legally binding, contractual preferably. Uh, we don't favour them being statutory, that would certainly be a last resort. But if we can get them as contractually binding obligations, that's uh, good and that's the approach being pursued in the United Kingdom by our counterpart. Um, in relation to sanctions, I'm personally, at least for um, uh, the foreseeable future, feel we need to focus more on the sanctions we've got. Contrary to what some people say, there is a requirement to publish all our adjudications and they are all published. They're not always published with sufficient prominence. In fact, I'd say, could almost say most of them are not published with sufficient prominence. And we will take a very firm line on that. Uh, there's already an obligation to do that and it needs to be a contractual obligation and it needs to be complied with. Um, so that, uh, not only so that um, the complainant has done justice, but also that the public sees what the council does. Um, one of the problems of the obscurity of the adjudications is that most people don't see uh, what we do enough. That's aggravated hugely, though, by the fact that most of our work doesn't go to formal adjudications anyway. Of the complaints that come to us, only about 10% proceed through to an adjudication that appears in a newspaper. The other 90% are either uh, resolved to the satisfaction of the complainant or the complainant gives up, not always satisfied. Um, but many of them, um, at least half, I'd say, it's the sort of thing it's pretty hard to measure with precision, are ones where there is a satisfactory resolution. But you would never hear about it. You would never know that it happened. The only people who know about it are the newspaper and the complainant in question. So most of our successes are completely unknown to the public. I'll just give you a, a small example that happened recently when Bernard Tomic um, had his um, uh, driving licence um, displayed on the website of a newspaper with all the details available. Now, that was fixed up in a couple of hours um, with the council calling the newspaper in question. And that's a quite a common outcome, but no one would know that. Uh, um, we need to get that acknowledged more so that people know that it's worth um, complaining to us. Uh, we will move more. We've agreed that we will censure newspapers where we think it's appropriate, that we'll call for apologies um, and corrections, but we won't direct them. We're not seeking the power to direct um, those apologies and corrections. If uh, we don't get the degree of compliance we need over time, well, we may or others may have to think about something firmer. But I think uh, we've got more than enough, frankly, to utilise the powers that we've got now to get them made legally binding and to utilise them properly. That's more than enough to keep us busy. Uh, 
Um, we need proper funding. Our, our resources have been hopelessly inadequate. Um, three and a half staff now will be four and a half soon. That's really derisory. And uh, uh, we've pushed for eight, not exactly contrary to one of our publisher members who said it was a cast of thousands. Um, <laughs> he may have missed mathematics class, I'm not sure, but, um, uh, you know, eight. Eight, and, but that's two million which is do dollars, which is double what uh, we've been getting. Uh, and I'm hopeful that the publishers will come to the party because that's not an AMBIT claim. That's uh, a very modest and uh, realistic claim for us just to be able to fulfil our basic responsibilities um, to the publishers who set us up uh, and to uh, the public who, in a sense, are relying on this to work rather than to push for something uh, more extreme. That money needs to be secure. Um, it is a spectre hanging over both my two immediate predecessors and myself. Um, are, are quite open about the fact that the risk of publishers withdrawing funding in their membership is a spectre that hangs over us. Of course we do our best to resist it, but it's a spectre and it's not a good spectre. We need to get rid of it. Uh, we need to have security of membership and funding uh, from uh, the uh, publishers and that's a very strong view held also in the UK and New Zealand uh, and agreed with, I think, by a number of publishers. And we also need, of course, our funding to at least provide some confidence that we're reasonably independent. If the publisher's money, if we're fully funded by the publishers, but the publishers can't withdraw that money, that significantly reduces the problems of lack of independence that one might think are pretty blindingly obvious if you're totally funded by the publishers. So if we can get that security, that fairly significantly addresses the independence problem. But we do also, and we've had agreement in the past, to get at least some money, project funding money, from other sources, and that could include uh, government. Um, but um, that's project money, not, uh, not core funding. And the key goal of all this is, I think, very well expressed by the, uh, the media minister in the United Kingdom, the, the uh, Conservative Party minister who's responsible for the media there, who says that what he's looking for in the reform there is a regulatory system which is independent of government and sufficiently independent of publishers to command public confidence. And to me, that's, that's a one-liner for what we've got to achieve. And I believe very firmly that we must make very substantial progress towards that demonstrable progress, accepted progress, uh, and substantial progress over the next three years. There is too much um, understandable scepticism about repeated assurances that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll lift our, ga our game or they'll lift our game, the publishers will support uh, this sort of operation. That, um, I think, is understandably met with by considerable cynicism and scepticism. And that's why I'm quite clearly putting uh, on the Council and on myself a three-year on-notice period. We've got to very substantially improve our performance and very substantially indicate that we can command public confidence in three years. Um, and uh, we'll need the publisher's support uh, to do that. Um, we, uh, I'll just mention a couple of other things that I think are important in, in how we go forward. We need to, you may have seen, I hope an increasing number will have, will have seen now that newspapers, most of the newspapers now, have our logo in them every day, indicating uh, how to contact us and uh, indicating also that they are bound by our standards of practice. Uh, that's a good step forward. It may have been one of the factors that contributed to the doubling of complaints that uh, Margaret referred to. Uh, we need to um, be uh, much more, um, much quicker uh, than we have been, although we're not, as, we're not as slow as some have suggested. I think perhaps the Finkelstein report, that's one area where I'd say it probably was a little astray in exaggerating the extent to which we're slow, but we're not, we're not quick enough uh, and we need, to, uh, we need to do that. Um, and we need to be rigorous and vigorous. Um, the uphold rate for our complaints increased from just over 40% to 70% uh, in the last uh, year. Now, we don't set a target for how many we uphold. That would be quite wrong. But uh, we did set a target of being more rigorous, and that's the consequence. If it drops to 50% this year, that won't necessarily suggest we've been uh, um, less rigorous. I don't want to be obsessed with that figure, but um, it was important, I think, as an indicator that we were taking things a bit more seriously. Um, and we also need to focus that the greatest number of complaints will always go and should always go to the publishers themselves. And so their internal standard system and their internal complaint systems are a crucial part of the whole uh, picture. Um, in many ways, our main goal should be to influence the internal standards and the internal complaints processes. Um, it's understandable that journalists would always, will always go first to their internal systems. Uh, and if they can work effectively, that's great. So we're going to engage much more with that. Uh, we're, we're seeking um, uh, access to uh, regular statistics as to the type of complaints being dealt with and the outcomes of them. 
uh, and I think we'll be proposing some benchmarks for a good complaint system, which will often consist of looking at best practice in different parts of the, of the media already. And we need to make our standards more readily um, available. I've already spoken with, with Phil Gardner, for example, um, from the Herald Sun here, uh, and with other editors about ways in which our standards can be put on the intranet or whatever other internal information system there is, so that there's a one-click stop, as it were, to see the, the standards of the newspaper and the standards of the uh, council. That's a very important practical thing if we want journalists to, um, to go down the right path. We're going to have to look a lot um, at online standards. That's going to be a key focus over the next few years, looking at the extent to which comment streams should be moderated, uh, you know, in other words, sifted and selected before the material is put on the stream. Not necessarily saying it should. There are various other methods that are being tried. It's a very um, fluid area, um, but we need to look at that. We need to look at the issue of what's often called reputation management, where a lot of people are very concerned that um, uh, information has been put uh, uh, it may be that 15 years ago they did something um, uh, regrettable. Um, it now comes out on the top when you Google their name in the search engine, even though, for example, if spent convictions legislation applies, that period will have passed. The spent convictions legislation now is a waste of paper because uh, your conviction uh, will probably come up uh, in, the, in the Google. So we need to look at that. That's the thing that's worrying online editors. They've actually asked us, when we had a meeting of online editors, they asked us to uh, help them develop rules. And we'll also do impact monitoring. Um, by that I mean that there's no point setting standards if we don't look at whether those standards are being complied with, not just rely on the complaint system. That's well known to be an inadequate way of assessing whether your standards are being complied with. And uh, apart from anything else, assessing whether the standards are wrong, you know, whether they need to be modified. I mean, if the standards are not being complied with, one has to look at least as much as whether they're wrong as whether, you know, they're right but not being complied with. So we will do impact monitoring if we can get the resources to do it. That's a key point. And I finish by saying uh, on that um, that we will also look at policy issues, but in the past the Council has tended too often, I think, to see itself as an advocate for the industry. Um, that's quite misconceived and it creates a, a clear conflict of interest to be an advocate for the industry, just saying this is what the industry wants, therefore we will push it in a debate on freedom of speech or whatever, clear conflict with our role uh, as a neutral um, a mediator and, and uh, arbiter, as it were, in complaints. Um, that was a point that uh, Mr Finkelstein was concerned about. He put to me that we shouldn't do any policy work for that reason. I don't agree with that. What was the mistake was to do policy work where we see ourselves as an advocate for the industry. Our role is to be concerned about the public interest, the broader public interest. A very important part of that will be the interest of the industry because that's very important in the public interest, but it's not the dominant. And finally, just as to where we go in phase two, um, after you know, a few years or whatever it may be, when we move towards convergence, um, as I've mentioned, we favour an independent council there rather than uh, a statutory authority. I emphasise that in moving towards convergence, and in, as in a sense all regulation being under one roof, doesn't mean the regulation needs to be totally uniform. There's, there's, there's um, clear opportunities and justifications for having uh, differences in processes, differences to some extent in standards, or certainly in the practical application of standards in particular areas. But we do need this all under one roof, um, so that where there's a huge risk of inconsistency or confusion, where particular material has occurred in different media, we need to get um, a harmonised, consistent approach to it if we're looking at a particular complaint or whatever. And that's one of the reasons why we need to come together under one roof. Uh, but we don't want uh, uh, the body to be legalistic. Uh, we don't want it to be slow. We don't want it to be government appointed. We also, of course, don't want it to be publisher dominated. But it's a crucial element is there needs to be a very strong engagement with publishers, uh, actively um, providing leadership within the council and in a non-adversarial way. Um, well, I'll just finish by saying that um, what, I, what I emphasised on the way through, that um, this is a huge challenge, but I believe that this is the sort of best hope for trying to move from where we are to where we should be. Um, uh, I think it's a pity that some of the publishers, in effect, gave Mr Finkelstein no option um, but to uh, go for another option um, other than the Press Council because they said they wouldn't provide any more resources. Now, I'm hopeful that attitude is changing. We're having negotiations right now to see if there will be a willingness to provide the significant improvement in resources we need. But I think it was a pity that, uh, in effect, Mr Finkelstein was deprived of being able to go down that route. Uh, we, uh, we want to go down that route and we want to achieve the substantial, demonstrable um, improvement in the next three years that I've mentioned. Thank you. <laughs>
you very much, Julian. Now, um, Julian has agreed to take some questions, and we'll move to that in just a moment. But first, a message from your sponsor. That's the Centre for Advanced Journalism. Um, we have a program of events. Please feel free to go to our website and uh, click on the appropriate links to get on our mailing list. But in particular, to tonight's topic, we have this upcoming short course. There's flyers for it out the front there, which is aimed at working journalists and newsroom executives. And in being a one-stop shop um, on a one-day short course um, on what press council standards actually are and what appropriate newsroom procedures are for handling public complaints, given, as Julian said, the very important, continuingly important frontline role of the publishers themselves in handling complaints. The other short course we're offering, um, also in April, um, is not directly relevant tonight, but it's uh, one I'm very proud to be overseeing. It's in advanced non-fiction writing with Helen Garner and Michael Gawenda running an intensive over two weekends for advanced non-fiction writers. Um, again, the flyers are available out the front, so please feel free to pick them up. But anyway, we have some time for some questions. I'm going to chair here. Please do make it questions, not statements or uh, speeches. Uh, there'll be other times for that, doubtless, and um, I'll ask Julian to respond. Uh, the lady there in the brown top and then What's up the back. Uh, can you just wait till the microphone reaches you, please? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, the, the question, I think, was, for those who didn't hear it, um, how can we be confident that the council won't be publisher-dominated if it is publisher-funded? Is, is that a fair summary? Yeah. Mm. Uh, well, that is the major challenge. It's not only a challenge in practice, but it's a challenge in perception. The greatest worry that people have about the council, and it's a perfectly understandable worry, is that we're fully funded by the publishers. Um, it's the counterpart of the publishers' worries if we were fully funded by the government. It's a fundamental pr problem, but it's a problem that uh, uh, we can try to reduce um, in, in a few ways. Firstly, as I said, if we can get security of publisher funding so that we're not at the mercy of it being withdrawn, that reduces the problem uh, to some extent. If we can also supplement it, as we have been uh, authorised to do in the past, so I, I got agreement from the council uh, 18 months or so ago for some project funding to come from other sources. We have some funding from the Meyer Foundation now. Um, I, I would like to develop that um, in the project area. And that's partly because, uh, in many ways, I mean, I've spent much of my life, really, uh, in organisations where we deliberately got funding from a wide range of sources. That's the best way, actually, of achieving independence, is diversity. You're very consciously, if you, for example, in the housing area where I was chairing a, a, a business and community coalition, you get some funding from the housing industry, but you get some funding and other support from shelter and groups like that that represent the tenants. And that way, you, uh, you, you can achieve an independence through the balance of your funding. Now, we may be able to go to, um, in that direction to some extent with the council um, through project funding. Um, it's going to be a tougher call in relation to uh, core funding um, as to whether um, that can be changed in any way. But I think that um, at least for the foreseeable future, if we get the security of publisher funding, that does significantly reduce the problem. I should mention too that actually our council, only a third of our council are actually publisher representatives. That's not widely known. Um, uh, so in that sense, it's, it's not dominated by the publishers. But of course, the power of the, the, power of the purse is um, important. But the other thing I'd say is that I think one can overcome some of those problems uh, by performance. Uh, and that's one reason why, if we've got enough resources to show that we are independent, to show that we're not under the thumb, then that can help to ameliorate that problem as well. I don't pretend it's not a problem, um, but you have to look at the problems with other options as well. And, and uh, what I'm keen on doing is trying to uh, ameliorate both the reality and the perception of that problem. OK, the question was, could we elaborate, or could Julian elaborate, on the contractual and binding nature of the obligations that are currently in place? Well, what we have in mind, we're working it through now, what we have in mind is that if, if you link the obligations to the Constitution, if you make them uh, either in the Constitution or next to the Constitution, there, you can create a, a contractual relationship with those who've joined the Council. Um, the, my counterpart in the UK uh, has actually um, drafted a, um, a detailed contract um, that he's wanting to get the industry to comply with there. I don't think we'll go that route. I'm not quite sure what you've got in the contract. It isn't available now. But we'll be mainly wanting to just get publishers by joining the council. That means they agree to comply with the constitution plus an extra. We already have a one-page summary of obligations uh, and on the back of it a one-page explanation of what that means in relation to publication of adjudications. There would be a few more obligations we would add to that. But it's that sort of order um, of things. And the obligations include... 
funding obligations, which I hope will be very specific. That's what a lot of the negotiations are about now. Obligations which admittedly are somewhat vague, but obligations to cooperate with our investigations and obligations to publish our adjudications and some detail about how, how that has to be done. But if they're contractually binding, they're then enforceable. The question was, is the Council concerned with media ownership and the way in which ownership issues might be reflected in coverage of particular issues? Yeah, well, well some aspects of ownership are relevant to us in that, um, uh, of course, declaring conflicts of interest is important. Um, and uh, um, how frequently you need have to declare, for example, when News Limited you know, owns um, rugby league teams, do they need to mention that all the time? Or are there ways in which we can uh, put people on notice of that who don't know but not be endlessly repeating the same thing every time? Um, so there, there are some issues that can arise there. And obviously some of those problems are aggravated if we have an increasing um, tendency for... Uh, either for media companies to undertake non-media activities or for non-media organisations to invest in media companies. I mean, that's been discussed a lot. And uh, that is relevant to us in the sort of medium or micro level of whether they declare conflicts of interest in particular cases. Another aspect in which it's relevant is that that's another reason why we're so keen to encourage uh, quality online um, publishing to get the... Uh, get greater attention, uh, greater, uh, broader credibility um, and help in some way, that, that, that in turn can provide greater diversity. If you look at the Finkelstein report, for example, I think basically the reporting of that in the print media was um, lamentable. Um, the reporting of it in the online media was infinitely better. But that uh, reporting, and I mean just by that saying what's, what's in it. Now, of course, that's partly taking advantage of online's ability to, to have more, you know, more copy. Um, that's one of the, the, the great benefits that it can bring. Um, but that's only of limited value if that stuff's only being read by a very small number of aficionados um, or, or people who probably need to get a life and, um, you know, <laughs> do, do other things. Um, so, and I, I couldn't help when I saw these five or six, I thought, really good articles, not necessarily ones I agreed with, but thoughtful, detailed articles. I thought this is a real pity that this isn't getting out into the mainstream print media as well and uh, there's no easy to answer this and our role in this is fairly small but, um, but it's relevant to the question of ownership and lack of diversity. Okay, the question was, does a system of regulation um, unfairly favour outlets such as the ABC and broadsheet newspapers over outlets such as tabloid newspapers which are still very popular and uh, which display some of the desirable qualities of aggression? Is that a fair summary? Yeah. Uh, well, of course, it all, it all depends how you do the regulation, um, whether you uh, uh, are too harsh um, or whether you take account of, firstly, whether your general application of standards, irrespective of what publication it's in, whether that's appropriate, but also whether you take account of your readership um, when you're forming a judgment. Um, the, uh, I don't think we have a very clear view. I, I don't think we would take the view in the council that there's a particular aspect of the print media that's uh, the biggest problem. I wouldn't see a huge divide between tabloids and broadsheet in that respect. Um, that's ceasing to be a terribly useful description anyway. Um, uh, but we do need to... Um, uh, you also need to be careful in assuming that uh, people want what they're reading. Uh, so be very careful in a limited market about assuming that the people who are reading the newspaper. I'm not saying this particularly about tabloids, I'd say it about uh, radio and other things. You need to be careful of assuming that those people actually particularly like what they're getting. Uh, and that's why these opinion polls are relevant as well. Um, you know, th it's, a bit, it's a bit glib for some to say, well, if people didn't like us, they wouldn't buy us. There aren't too many options. Um, and so we need to be careful of uh, giving that um, too much weight. Uh, but I don't, uh, I don't see... Um, I mean, I read the tabloids uh, uh, as much as... Well, we're talking here really about the telly and the Herald Sun. Um, I read them about as much as the broadsheets. Um, and um, uh, there's some very good stuff there, which often benefits from being succinct, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> OK, the question was, uh, the ABC and the SBS um, are independent bodies despite being dependent on government funding and... Uh, there's confusion about why government funding necessarily means a reduction in independence and could the council follow a model similar to that? 
Um, well, there are different views about that within the council, as I mentioned. So some people regard any government funding as anathema and think it's impossible to be um, uh, funded by government, although often I, I do wish there would be a greater um, sophistication in that discussion because it often speaks as if government funding means full government funding, just as it often speaks as if any statutory involvement means a statutory authority. Now, in the UK, for the reasons I mentioned, they've been... Uh, pushed perhaps into a more sophisticated analysis and realising there's a whole spectrum of options in terms of statutory involvement which can fall very far short of a statutory authority. The same applies to government funding. As I say, the Council's already agreed that we can take some project funding, but I, I, I actually initiated, um, when uh, that motion was put forward, I actually initiated the fact that we should have a ceiling on that, um, and a ceiling well below 50%, uh, and that's just for project funding. So. Some, some government funding, um, I think, can be acceptable, but there's also, uh, again, here we've got perception and reality. Um, so one of the reasons why I don't like full or dominant government funding is that it would cast a, um, a spectre of suspicion over what that agency did, even if it wasn't being pushed around by government at all. It's the counterpart of the problem with full publisher funding. Um, so, uh, you know, in, a, in an ideal or even remotely ideal world, I, I would prefer that um, this regulatory body is overwhelmingly funded by non-government sources, if we can do that. Right, well, that's it, I'm afraid. Thank you very much for your attendance, and thanks most of all to Professor Julian Disney. Please join me in thanking him again. <laughs>